William Collins, a warrior, a bard of Strabane, 1838-1890. In my youth summer holidays were days spent with our gang up the Curly Hill or along the River Mourne. There were the Low Rocks, the High Rocks, McGregor's Woods, and along the river, there were the homes in the doctor's water for swimming. I learned to swim there in 1953 and 1954. Strabane Glen was special. There was Hamilton's Leap, Lundy's Cave, the Cottage Lee, the Crow's Nest. These names were implanted in my imagination long before I ever learned the historical significance of them. Often I climbed Knockavo to admire the view of the surrounding counties of Tyrone, Donegal and Derry. From there you could follow the Mourn of Cyan Mills and the Foyle to near Derry and the Finn up as far as Clary. Twice in my life I lived away from Strabane, once for three years in Manchester as a student and later for three years as a teacher in Andolia and Zambia. I often reflected on home and could appreciate the beauty, the nostalgia, the absence of home, and know what an emigrant might feel. Enter William Collins. William Collins was born in Strabane in 1838. He left his hometown, or rather, he ran away from his hometown, as some sources claim, in 1953 to face the fresh challenge of life in the young country of America. The American connection of Straban is associated with several. Carlton on the left, Wilson at the top of screen, Dunlop center of screen, and William Collins, to the right. An image of William Collins. Collins never returned to Straban, but the pictures burned in his mind were fresh, clear, and imprinted. He was born on Orney Road in 1838, emigrated to America at a young age around 1855. He participated in the ill-fated Fenian raid into Canada in 1866, led by General John O'Neill. He was a writer of poems, of songs, of war and ballads, and he wrote A Sigh for Old Times. An image here of the foil from Strabane Glen. And an image here taken from Lifford of Nakavo and the early town of Strabane. An image of Mill Town. These were all places. These were all places that Collins was familiar with. In the words, and this is the Cottage Lee in Strabane Glen. And an image from Mill Town of Crohan in Lifford. And this would have been an old image of the Bowling Green in Straban, which Collins would be very, very familiar with. The house in centre is that of Sir Guy Carlton. Oh, God be with the good old days when I was 21, and to roam among the bushes where the fin and morn run. When my heart was gay and merry, wrecked then not with toil or care, blithesome as the bells of Derry, ringing o'er the sunny foil. There's not a spot round old Straban, but memory treasure still, from Milltown wide to Crohan side, but has my right goodwill. And all my comrades, and true I loved in days gone by, who roamed with me in reckless glee, by many a bank and brae. The Curly Hill our playground was, our camp, the Cottage Lee. Within the glen were outlawed men in other days roamed free. And riding on the white-capped waves 
with merry noise and din, we wild the summer days away upon the point of Finn. The origin of the words of the phrase to roam among the bushes are often attributed to Collins. This is incorrect, as the origin of the phrase belongs to a fellow Tyrone man, that of the writer William Collins. But William Collins, or Billy, as he often referred, came from the Orney Road in Straban. An image of the 50s of Bradley's Corner and Orney Road is on the right. Again from the 50s, the little bray that runs up um, uh, towards um, the village of Clary. Collins' upbringing was influenced by his parents, both natives of Munster, and many visitors to the Collins' home. His father, Thomas, was a staunch nationalist and supporter of the revolutionary activities of the Young Irelanders, who had launched a rebellion in 1848. William grew up learning of the heroic deeds of Cúhollán, the United Irishmen of 1798. The home was a hub of revolutionary activity and a meeting place for many Northern nationalists of the time. William learned to read and write at an early age and had access to the newspapers of the time, notably The Nation, a newspaper edited by Thomas Davis of the Young Irelanders. Collins was further influenced by Thomas Davis when he received a book of poems by Davis from a traveling peddler from Castle Finn at the fair in Straban. Legend has it that the influence of ballads and songs such as Wearing of the Green and Shan, and Shan Van Vogt, the Irish Hurrah, and a song of the Irish militia. These songs fired up the mind and imagination of the young William. In 1953, William left or ran away traveling first to Quebec, then to a place called Bytown in Ottawa, where he worked as a farmhand. And then he spent his time in a place called um, Amprior um, in Upper Ottawa, where he worked as a farmer and as a logger. While there, he continued to write his poetry. At the outbreak of the American Civil War, Collins traveled to Cleveland, which was close to where he was living, and he joined the Union Army. In 1865, at the end of the Civil War, he joined the Fenian Brotherhood, known as the Fenians, and under the influence of General John O'Neill, a Monaghan man, William enlisted in the army assembled to march on British colonies in Canada. In 1866, the Fenian army advanced on Buffalo on the Canadian border. And on the 2nd of June, the Redcoats, the Queen's own rifles under Lieutenant Alfred Booker, confronted the Fenians uh, at, a, at the Battle of Lime Ridge or Limestone Ridge near the town of Buffalo. This represents the line of the Fenians on the advancing red coats. Legend has it that when the red coats encountered the battle hardened Fenians, bearing the Fenian sunburst in an insignia, yelling like savages, 
Booker's forces panicked and retreated. Casualties were minimal, numbering a mere six Fenian dead and nine redcoats. Collins submitted the episode two words in his 11 verses of the poem, The Battle of Limestone Ridge, extolling the virtues and bravery of the 400 Fenians, gaining a great victory over 1,600 redcoats. In vain and vain, on field and plain, like stricken deer they fly. Our bullets speed, they sink and bleed, and stagger, fall and die. The field is red and piled with dead. The sunburst waves above the graves, and limestone ridge is won. In an interview with Patrick Donahue, a journalist and friend, Collins told him that Booker had been court-martialed for cowardice. I could not believe that Englishmen could have proven themselves such cowardly runaways if I had not been an eyewitness to the fact. Though Collins by this stage was now an Irish American, he was mindful of the role played by Irish men and Straban men in particular, like John Dunlap, Thomas Nelson, and Thomas McKean. John Dunlap had been the printer of the American Declaration of Independence in 1776. Dunlap came from Meeting House Street in Straban. He printed the American Declaration of Independence. But back in Cleveland, Collins continued to write his poetry on Irish historical themes, like Rory O'Hanlon, the brave rapparee, and on his personal images and memories of Straban. He wrote about the places of interest, including rivers and glens. And in 1874, he left for New York to write for the Irish World, founded by Galway man Patrick Ford. New York, a New York born publisher, PJ Kennedy, he decided he took an interest in the writing of Collins. And in December 1875, he published Ballads, Songs and Poems by William Collins, a 360 page compilation of poems on rapparees, historical and legend, and Irish American themes, which included the Battle of Limestone Ridge. Reviews, including the Morning Star, concluded, we do not know who Mr. Collins is, but the book before us is convincing proof that the author is an Irishman whose heart is full of Ireland's sufferings and whose hand, unable to bear a sword, is at least determined to wield a poem in defense of his country's cause. He was proof that the pen can be mightier than the sword. From April to October, 1876, a selection of poems appeared in the Dublin-based magazine, Young Ireland. Among them was a poem about the recusant soldier and a gentleman called Hamilton, who on returning to his hideout above Strabane Glen one evening, was chased by Cromwellian redcoat soldiers and in order to avoid capture, jumped with his horse to his death on the cliff ledge. The legend in the Glen has since been known as Hamilton's Leap. Again, out of the 11 verses, I've chosen two. Verse seven, a wide rocky chasm lay yawning before him. Hope of escape there was none to be seen. As onward like lightning, his steed swiftly bore him o'er rocks and heather and mossy banks. In verse 11, still bearing his load, 
as his weight was a feather, his master's resolve the brave horse seemed to know. Gave one last desperate leap, and they both there together lay shattered and dead on the rocks far below. When Collins moved to New York, he lived at 530 Myrtle Avenue in Brooklyn with his wife and daughter. Several children had died in childbirth, but they had four cats called Johnny, Bootsy Swing and McSwiggan. He wrote for the Lamp Journal, edited by T.E. Bradley, and while living in Myrtle Avenue, he wrote four novels about Ireland. Sibylla, which was a tale of the County Tyrone, The Wild Geese, Desmond, a tale of two fl flags, and Dallar Dalriadden, The Days of King M M Melko, an historical novel set in the fifth century Ireland. His reputation was growing as a writer and a poet. On the morning of the 2nd of July, 1888, on the 25th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, Collins was invited to speak at the Union Army Veterans Irish Brigade. Ceremony at the newly erected Celtic Cross in the center of the battlefield of Gettysburg, in the cemetery, he recited a poem specially written for the occasion in memory of the fallen. This is a list of those speakers who were invited. And as you can see towards the bottom, a poem by William Collins. Peace spreads her wings of snowy white o'er Gettysburg today. No sound is heard of coming fight no marshalling for the fray. War's grim battalions dream no more at morn the foe to greet. The long, long fitful strife is o'er and we as comrades meet. This poem was printed in countless newspapers and magazines in America and was considered as one of his best productions. Patrick Donoghue, never thought Collins had great literacy ability and considered William Carleton's work of a superior level. But he described Collins as a man who was not interested in chasing the muck of money, but in the pursuit of freedom, patriotism was his passion. He described him as good natured and generous. The death of his daughter in January, 1890, left Collins a broken man and led to his remaining month as a recluse. He died at the age of 52 on the 4th of February 1890 and was buried in Holy Cross Cemetery in Flatbush, Long Island. A tribute was paid to him in the local papers Collins was a, a, a prodigious writer um, for American magazines and weeklies. Three weeks later, um, a tribute was paid to him in the Tyrone Constitution. And it's read, William Collins, who was born in Straban, went to the United States, the outbreak of the war, he participated, and he died in Brooklyn on the fifth, um, on the 50th year of his age, uh, after an, an illness of about five weeks. And on the close of the Civil War, he settled in Cleveland, Ohio, um, and he took part in the um, O'Neill Rebellion. Patrick Donoghue appealed to his readership of the Donoghue magazine to send donations to defray the cost of the funeral expenses and to build a headstone in Holy Cross and to support Mrs. Collins in her hour of need. Six New York newspapers donated a total of $42, which would be the equivalent of $1,100 in today's money.
A few years later, a 35-year-old solicitor, an antiquarian from uh, Tyrone, Alexander Albert Campbell, set out compiling a literary history of what he called Old Strabane Town. Campbell, who was then practicing law at Waring Street in Belfast, uh, went, he said, to rescue um, from oblivion the names of those who had made an impact on the literary world. Published in 1902 by the Tyrone Constitution, Campbell's book featured in sketches of Collins's life and included all eight verses of A Sigh for Old Times. The list included many of the um, book of the poems listed. Edith Weeder, under the title of one of her poems in 1903 and in 1933, became the title of the book by um, M. Foster. And if we look back as far as 1845, we see it appear in the legend of Not Manny, a short story included in a book called Tales and Sketches of the Irish Peasantry. The author, William Carlton, had used the phrase uh, in Tyrone among the bushes. Having listened to the rebel, the rebellion as a boy, Collins fought as a, a soldier um, on uh, the American and uh, Canadian soil, William Collins laid down his sword and, and took up the pen. Perhaps he is best remembered for his, um, for his poem, uh, the, um, uh, the best remembered as the warrior Bard of Straban. Uh, Collins wrote um, a poem at the foot of Knock of o. Um, it's a love song, a, a love poem put to music by a man called Joseph Gormley of Main Street, Straban, who was an uncle of um, the, the great uh, Brian O'Nolan, alias Flan O'Brien. And this was uh, sung by Sister Ursula McHugh, who's a well-known um, uh, historian um, from Castle Derry.
would just like to finish off um, uh, looking at the portrait of Collins and moving on. I would like to dedicate this to Mr. Eugene Dunphy, who was my inspiration for this research. And um, uh, he had shared it with me at the time. He brought the music of Asai for Old Times to my attention. Um, interestingly, the music that he sings um, was written by a Straban man called Leon Turish, and Jim Bradley had provided him with the words of the song. So just going back to the, the, to the song, and just a couple of lines of it. Are you hearing this? Ray dance, the music loud and rose To the wind it shakes the barley shook the sorrow from my soul Then Kitty, dark eyed Kitty, let out shone the fairest queen For the rocky road to double and tilted with me upon the green Ronan, that would conclude it then. Hello. Thanks very much, Michael. That's fantastic. Much appreciated.